The TV Booth Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 7 of the TV Booth Podcast. My guest today began his career in independent local radio, but he'll be best known as a continuity announcer for Television South and London Weekend Television. Trish Bertram described him as her television husband. I am delighted to welcome Glenn Thompson to the TV Booth Podcast. Hello, I'm Glenn Thompson, formerly of London Weekend Television and TVS, and you're listening to TV Booth Podcast. Glenn, welcome to the TV Booth Podcast. Rob, thank you very much for asking me. Lovely to be here. And I've got a nice, warm, steaming cup of tea in my hand, all ready for a chat. Fantastic. Well, I've got a nice glass of lime and water. Oh, OK. Today, so Perfect. let's begin at the, uh, the start of your life. Did you always want to work in television and radio? Yes, I suppose I did, really. I'd, do you want to start right at the beginning? Is that is that the plan? Should we go right the That's, way back? Yeah, let's let's go right back to the beginning. Let's sit in that Rob Francis time machine and whiz ourselves back to uh, 1975 when I left school. And I didn't do university because university in those days, Rob, was uh, was always regarded as something for people with, you know, a bit of money. They're quite wealthy and they send their kids to university. My folks weren't that wealthy. We farming background. And uh, I got an apprenticeship as a carpenter and joiner. I left school, wanted to originally be a post office, back in those days, a post office telephone engineer, telecommunications engineer, BT now, of course. I always had an interest in electronics and uh, went for the interview, did a little sort of colour test. They do an eye colour test and I, I passed that and didn't quite get into the position I wanted to get into. There was no job openings at the time. So Dad said, well, I can get you an apprenticeship as a carpenter and joiner if you want. He played cricket with a local builder and uh, he got me in as a as a chippy and I did my three years City and Guilds apprenticeship. And uh, that was my sort of venture into the world of work, if you like. It was straight in earning money. I did six months, uh, what they call block release, where you go in solidly to college in Swindon, it was. And then it was two and a half years day release. So I would work four days a week and go to college one day a week, the other four days working on site, sort of building, you know, houses, putting roofs on, filling kitchens and a bit of time in the joiner shop as well. And it was at that time that I always had my radio with me, and I just loved music. And I was known on the building sites as Tom the Tranny. <laughs> that's not to say transvestite. That's to say Tom the Transistor Radio, because, of course, in those days, it was all about having a transistor radio. And everywhere I went, Rob, I had a radio with me. And I used to listen to the likes of Tony Blackburn, and I listened to Johnny Walker unveiling the brand-new chart on a on a Tuesday afternoon at lunchtime. And I thought, yeah, I'd love to do what those guys do, but how on earth do I go about it? And life just carried on for about four or five years on the building sites. And then my dad saw an ad in the local paper. It was either the Chippenham News or it was um, the Wiltshire Gazette and Herald. I think it was probably the, the Wiltshire Gazette and Gazebo, as we used to call it. And it said, the headline read, do you think you could do better than Noel Edmonds or Tony Blackburn? Now is your chance to prove it. The Devizes Hospital's broadcasting service... Uh, are looking for volunteer people to join them. So Dad said, go on, ring them up. You know, take the bull by the horns and give it a go. So I rang up, spoke to a guy called Justin, Justin Lennox, Justin Leonard. He had a programme on hospital radio called Just In Time. And uh, that is where it all started, really. Yeah, way, way back in the, in the late 70s, Rob. And because of your carpentry background, I hear from a certain Mr. Nick Harvey. Ah, Mr. Harvey. You, you always re they always referred to the programme as Glenn Thompson finishing off Saturday on DHBS by rounding it off with his surfform. That's right. Yeah, Nick always <laughs> took great pleasure in, in naming that programme uh, Rounded Off with Glenn Surfform. Yeah, good old Nick. He, you know, great guy. We sort of travelled around the country visiting radio stations and, uh, and what have you. But it was a great time at Hospital Radio and Devices. I learnt so much there. And if anybody's listening to this for the first time and they're thinking, I'd love to get into the business, Hospital Radio is a great place to start because who cares if you make the odd mistake? People are in hospital. They're there to get better. And that's what we were trying to do is to help them get better by playing music taking requests and uh 
you know, it was a great place to learn the trade. We did fantastic outside broadcasts. One big one at Bow Woods, which was a big uh, country landowners association game fair, uh, which uh, Quentin Howard, uh, Quentin was very much instrumental in digital radio in the UK. And he was uh, an engineer and uh, gave me my first break in local radio. But uh, we'll come on to that in just a moment. Uh, but we did great outside broadcasts with DHBS. And, you know, the, uh, the game fair, we did all the carnival processions in devices. And it was just a great place to learn the trade, how to uh, edit tape, how to talk into a microphone, how to use a mixing desk in the studio and it was just fabulous memories you know i met some great people there and uh, still in touch with a lot of them to this day how did you make the transformation from radio to television what inspired you to become a continuity announcer well the inspiration again that goes back to the 70s and it was well, probably earlier than the 70s actually it was growing up in the chippenham area in wiltshire we used to watch obviously htv was our regional itv company coming out of bristol and i uh, i used to watch people like uh, peter lewis so i later went on to work with at london weekend television peter was a, a weekday announcer with htv and uh, michael st john there was uh, oh lots of the great announcers from uh, our HTV days and here's one of those jingles I didn't and one of the people that I thought was very very funny and he used to get huge audience figures on close down this is back in the days when before 24-hour television a guy called Michael St John reading the clock uh, at the end of transmission they'd always say that's it from tonight so they'd play the national anthem and then they'd cut to the clock and up would come the clock on the on the television screen, and uh, Michael would say, "And uh, final look at the time. Now it's coming round to uh, twenty five minutes past uh, one. No, it's twenty two minutes. No, just a minute. It's twenty three minutes past." <laughs> he could never quite get the grasp of reading the time properly. He couldn't work out this where the minute hands were, were landing and how to sort of tell the time. And as a result of that, the audience figures at closed down on HTV in Bristol would go up. HTV in the West Country would go up. And it was just a fascinating viewing to watch Michael St. John on HTV closed down. And it was him, really, along with Peter Lewis and the others. Was it Peter Marshall as well? He was one of the other Envision announcers. I thought, yeah, I'd love to do that job. I'd love to do that work. But I thought television was well out of my grasp. So I, I really focused on radio. And Nick and I, Nick Carvey, you mentioned just now from Hospital Radio, Nick and I would go up to Birmingham quite frequently at weekends to visit BRMB Radio, which was the big player in the Midlands at the time. And uh, Quentin Howard, who was an engineer at uh, BRMB, would invite us up to watch the sport and music show go out on a Saturday afternoon. There was a guy called Tony Butler. And it was at that time that we managed to get a trip to Central Television in Birmingham. And, of course, the forerunner to Central, of course, was uh, ATV. <laughs> And Mike Prince, of course, was one of the great announcers on ATV. Then we went, to, as I say, to visit Central. A guy called Stuart White was uh, one of my early inspirations as well to get into continuity. He was a, an announcer on Central. He's now a main news anchor for Look East in Norwich, the BBC's uh, Look East programme. And uh, I thought, yeah, I love this whole ambience of this studio. The, the camera there, the seat here, the Central Television logo behind him, this whole ambience, this sort of darkened studio studio I'd, I love this whole atmosphere I'd love to do this one day but again I thought that was completely out of the realms of possibility so I pursued the career in radio so BRMB bit of work there a little bit of work with with Quentin and then Quentin got the chief engineer's job with Seven Sound in Gloucester he then took me on as a, a technical operator and an engineer driving the radio car around and uh, operating programs and it was at Seven Sound I got my first uh, break as a presenter the Saturday evening rock show presenter a guy called Alan Roberts went off sick and uh, Eddie Vickers, the then programme controller, rang me up while I was finishing off the sport and music programme as a tech op. He said, Glenn, would you like to do the rock show? And I thought, yeah, I'd love to have a go at the rock show. He said, don't worry about the music. I'll bring all the records in. This is back in the days when it was on vinyl. And uh, I sat there and, and did an hour's worth of rock show playing ACDC, Led Zepp, you know, all the big rock stars <laughs> of the time. Eddie came in on the Monday, said, 
that was brilliant. I loved that rock show. He said, do you want to do it full time? So I, I took the show off Alan Roberts, who didn't want to do it anyway, because he was the breakfast show presenter during the week. So they gave me the rock show. And that was my first feed into local radio as a presenter via the route of being an engineer. It was just great fun. So from there, I went to Wiltshire Radio, which became GWR in Swindon. And from there, I went to Mercia Sound in Coventry as the evening pro show presenter. And from Mercia Sound, in Coventry. I was offered a job in 1984 at Invicta Radio in Kent as the breakfast show presenter. Was did that for 10 years. Uh, met up with my wife, who was uh, Julie Jambuster. She was the flying eye at the time. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. It was at Invicta when I saw an ad in, I think it was Broadcast, or which is the trade publication, or I think it was probably the other ad I saw it in the uh, media section of the Guardian newspaper. And it was for announcers. They were advertising for announcers for TVS, Television South, they were going to split their transmission east and west of the region. So obviously the main region, the main headquarters being in Southampton. And they had Vinters Park, a newly opened studio complex in Maidstone in Kent. And they were looking for announcers to work from there. And so I applied. I went through the usual process, wrote a little letter, as you did before the days of email. And uh, it was answered by a guy called John Gordon. <laughs> John rang me back, didn't uh, write to me, he rang me back, and he said, uh, Glenn, we're holding auditions in Maidstone on whatever day, Tuesday the 4th of October, would you like to come in? So I said, yes, I will, I'll come in. He said, be prepared for putting a few links down. And I thought, what do you mean links? He said, well, have a look at the telly tonight. Those are links between the programmes. It's when the announcers pop up and they say what's coming up on the television for that evening. So I thought, okay, I'll get the TV times, radio times, cobble together a few little links. And he said, be prepared to be in vision, talking to the camera. So I did, I went in with my suit on and uh, looked very sort of tarted up as they say. And I did the continuity links in vision, they liked them. And then about three weeks later, I thought, what's going on? I've not heard a thing. John then got back in touch with me. He said, sadly, we're not having announcers now. We've, we've had a change of mind. We're not going to do east and west transmission splits. So they, they built it in, in Maidstone, a complete continuity studio and gallery, you know, the whole control room for that split transmission. But it didn't actually happen in the end. So the studio that they had uh, put aside for transmission in Maidstone later become what they called Studio P. It was the news studio where they used to do the uh, day time news bulletins from so i thought okay well that's my chance blown i'm, I'm never going to get a job doing continuity but then john about two months later said look we've got an opening coming up in southampton for uh, an out of vision continuity announcer would you like to be put forward for it? i said yes of course no problem but that would mean me losing my breakfast show on invictus so i had to make that very very tough decision of do i go down the telly route full time or do i stay with radio for a little while i did both. So during the week, I did my breakfast show for Invicta five days a week. And then at weekends, Saturday and Sunday, I would do continuity shifts at TVS in Southampton. So I was effectively working seven days a week for what seemed like an eternity. So that was my first break, Rob, into the world of continuity work. It was with TVS in Southampton. So you've worked for TVS and then London Weekend Television come calling. Yes. How did all that come about? Well, it wasn't actually London Weekend come calling. What happened was, while well, I was working with uh, TVS in Southampton, Trish Bertram, lovely Trish, who, of course, we all know. Lovely Trish. Uh, lovely Anyone? Trish. We all love Trish. <laughs> and uh, you spoke to Trish, of course, on a previous podcast. Wonderful. Hello, Thank Trish. Indeed. And she said, while well, I was working with her, that London Weekend Television were looking for uh, an announcer. She said, why don't you give uh, Lucy Booth? Here's the contact details. So I rang Lucy, made an appointment to go and see her and didn't even get an audition as such. I wasn't even sat into a studio to do a little test. They just literally landed me in the deep end. She knew I could do the job from TVS. And of course, in those days, it was all very much a close-knit community and each region knew what the others were doing. And I'm guessing, you know, uh, she could pick up TVS at the London Weekend Television Studios on the South Bank. So she knew what I could do on air and obviously I had the radio background as well so that sort of put me in good stead and sure enough I was given lots of freelance shifts virtually every weekend with London Weekend so I was doing work for <laughs> talk about crazy workload I was doing Invicta Radio breakfast during the week I would do the odd shift at TVS in Southampton and I would do the odd shift freelance 
uh, for London Weekend Television. So I was effectively working for three different broadcast organisations. So I thought at the end of the day, right, I've got to make a choice here. Who am I going to go with? I thought, well, London Weekend, yeah, big company, big sort of iconic company, makes big shows for the network, very show busy, very razzmatazz. I'll go with London Weekend. They then offered me a full-time position and that started in 1988 and I was with LWT until that very sad closed down in October 2002. So I was there all that time. And I've got to say, Rob, it was the best days I've ever had in telly. Most fun. Great people who I'm still very much in touch with to this day. Great camaraderie. And, uh, yeah, we just had wonderful fun doing a job that we all had great pride in doing. So you must have a lot of great memories of working at LWT. What, what were your best memories Best memories, I think possibly, it's not good to call them best memories. I think the most poignant were the times when, sadly, very important people died. And we had had a big effect on what we did as a, as a television company, of course. Trish was on duty, as she said to you on a, a previous podcast, when Diana sadly died. That took the whole world by complete surprise because someone so young it was just so so tragic that she died so young i was on duty the night the queen mum died we knew something was happening because itn had sort of given us the tip off trish was on the early shift i'd come in to take over the uh, late shift so the early shift would go from 9 20 or 9 o'clock the shift would start until 5 and then the late person would take over from 5 until finish normally about one o'clock in the morning that would be pre-recorded stuff in the latter days overnight so we knew something was was adrift with the queen mum we'd heard rumblings and trish said i'm just going to go down to the bar at the end of her shift like we always used to uh have a quick drink and i'll hang around just in case anything happens and sure enough an hour into my shift about six in the evening we got a call through from itn saying on the talkback saying that uh you know, the Queen Mum has died. We need to hand over to ITN for what they used to call an open-ender, uh, when ITN would just go on air and not sure what time they would come off. Hence, it was an open-ender. So at that point, I rang Trish back down in the bar. I said, look, Trish, Queen Mum's died. Any chance you could pop back? And uh, we'll sort out what we're going to do for the evening. So as Trish mentioned on her podcast, when Diana died, it was a question of the announcers getting together with uh, the head of presentation, uh, the head of the department's, the transmission people to really go through and reshape the output for the network so it was up to us as the weekend nominated network contractor basically we were in charge of the network for the weekend and it was thames or carlton in the latter days during the week so we were known as the nominated network contractor and it was up to us to make those major decisions so trish came back hurtling down the corridor and she said gt what's happened what's happened and i obviously went through it and we sat down with the paper schedule you know it was back in the days of paper <laughs> schedules a big thick wadge of a4 tipped on its side and uh, that was our schedule you know every page had a different junction on it all the ads were listed the promos the programs the junctions how long you had to speak latterly it was obviously all one computer it was computerized so we knew exactly what uh, we had to say time slots we had to talk and trish and i and the transmission team we literally rewrote the whole schedule for that evening uh, moved things around obviously you have to go on air with a certain amount of reverence in your voice you can't be too over the top bear in mind the news what's happened this this awful news that the queen mums died i mean she was a good age but still you know a dreadful dreadful shock when it does happen so those were my sort of memorable times of uh, working at london weekend television lots of other ones as well happier ones but uh, those are the most poignant i think to to recollect yeah so when i spoke with trish she told me about a, a very funny blooper involving a bit of a tongue twister on on her side mm. um were there any bloopers for you <laughs> yeah there was actually i remember one fondly back at tvs actually in southampton and it was uh it was in the days when the daytime news bulletins would be on for a couple of minutes three minutes so they would be in the studio next door a smaller built news bulletin studio and the continuity studio which i was sat in was right next door opposite the transmission suite in uh, the corridor at tvs and so what would happen is they'd finish the news bulletin and then we always did the weather forecast so the transmission guys would cut up a slide of the tvs region and the announcer would say and now the weather forecast for the tvs region and as you can see there'll be pissed matches 
I mean <laughs> missed patches. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a bit of a spoonerism that came out a little bit not quite the right way. So it was back in the days when we used to put the graphics up and uh, they'd cut up the weather forecast slide and the, the announcer would have the duty of reading maybe a 20, 30 seconds weather forecast. So, yes, uh, missed patches came out as, uh, as pissed matches. I shall never forget that. John Gordon, who was head of presentation at the time, came into the studio about um, an hour later and said, hmm, Glenn, what happened there at uh, just after the three o'clock uh, weather forecast? I said, John, sorry, it's just a twist of words. But he was a great guy, and John always came up with a great phrase that I've always remembered to this very day, it's only television, or it's only radio. And he said that after something that I did going into an episode of Coronation Street one night at TVS. Back in those days, you would cross-reference all your material, and you would write all your links, which I don't think the guys and girls do these days. It's all done for them by script writers but in our day back in Trish and I's my day and my colleagues Graham Bannerman on Carlton and Mark Lipscomb and other people we wrote our own links so you saw on the schedule a nine second hole to fill and it would say link in brackets PT it meant point so you'd point to a program coming up later in the schedule and um, so you'd have to make a little reference to something there and then get back on track to introduce the program you were going into I made a bit of a cock-up, basically, going into Coronation Street. I didn't cross-reference my material properly. So you had the TV Times, the Radio Times, programme synopsis from the programme makers, all the press notes. You cross-reference all those, and if they tally up, then you can write your link. But I didn't quite get the facts right going into one particular episode of Coronation Street. Got it wrong. John Gordon came in the next day because he was a great Corrie fan, and he said, Glenn, couldn't help but notice the info you gave up going into last night's Coronation Street wasn't quite correct. What was the reason for that? So I told him, I said, look, I just got the material from one source. That was it. Biggest mistake ever. Don't get it from just one source. And uh, John said, but don't worry, Glenn. It's only television. Nobody died. You haven't got 500 people sitting behind you in a jumbo jet, you know, a 747s. And I've always remembered that. It's only television. It's not live or death. It's only radio. So why people get so het up about it, I've no idea. You know, we did the job to the highest professional standards, and we had the biggest fun doing it as well. So I've always remembered that from John. Yeah, great days. Let's talk about 2002 now, and the, um, the end of LWT. Oh, yeah. I was, we heard from Trish about it, but what was it like for you? when well, LWT finally said farewell. Well, Rob, it was so sad. It was such a very, very sad occasion. We knew it was coming. We knew that the mighty Granada machine was was rumbling into town, and uh, we knew the writing was on the wall. But when it, when it actually came, it was a shock. Lucy Booth, our head of uh, department, she took Trish and I out for a bite to eat, told us what was going to happen, um, said that you're going to have the option to take redundancy, we'll train you, you can have a, a bit of money to go off and train for something else, which they, they duly did, um, which was great. I went off and did a bit of web design, got a certificate for that, for various uh, things to do with the web. And uh, it was great, great use of money. I also went on a, a broadcast journalist law course, used the money for that as well, because at that time I wasn't doing news. I'd been working in programme presentation. I was a DJ on the radio. I was a jock, rambling up to the vocals on songs. I was very much a pop and prattle jock in, in my early days of radio. And then I later became involved in news. And uh, so I went off and did a law course for broadcast journalism. And Trish and I basically we sat down with Lucy. And Lucy told us that, you know, in October 2002, the whole the whole jolly journey is going to come to a grinding halt. And it was incredibly sad. And I'm sure you can remember this. Well, things will be a little different from tomorrow, won't they, Trish? They certainly will, Glenn. From tomorrow, ITV1 will be coming at you with a whole new look, which means, sadly, this is where you and I bow out. It certainly is, but it's been fun, though, Trish. It's been many years, Glenn. So, for the final time... From our studios on the South Bank... This is LWT... London Weekend Television. So that was a link that we did in Vision. Uh, Gareth Randall, who was in the promotions department at London Weekend Television, uh, Lucy, myself, Trish, a load of other people, thought, we've got to go out in style. We need to do something to see off this iconic broadcasting company. So we did a whole day. That whole weekend was done of memories, uh, of slides that were, looked like they looked from years ago and we put up 
uh, music, iDents, and uh, the farewell link was recorded. That one that you see on YouTube has been viewed thousands of times now by people. Uh, we did that as a pre record. And my last link was out of vision. And uh, yeah, huge emotion. I had to really control my voice because it was really, it was really breaking. I think I linked into the South Bank show, did a couple of links after the South Bank show. And I, when I actually closed that mic off for the final time, I just, well, tears were rolling down my eyes. I just was so, so sad. And uh, to this day, you know, when I look back at that link that Trish and I did, I just have these shivers down my spine, these, these great jingles that we used to play on the idents. And one of my favourite idents, Rob, is what I call the Solari. It was known as the Shutters ident. I don't know if you remember, it was like a, a, a white background with the LWT logo symbols, the letters LWT, and it was like a shutter effect. And that was one oh, of my, wow. that was one of my favourite idents. Back in those days, we also had the power as announcers to decide on what idents we wanted to use. And we could, if we wanted to change a junction, we could change it. We could maybe shift a promo. We could put an ident in there. We could say, look, shout through on talkback. Any chance we could put the four second Solari in there rather than the long ident, the longer ident. So we had that sort of flexibility in those days to, to work the schedule uh, to make it look appealing on air. I hate to slate people today because they do a great job. But I think under different, very different circumstances, they have now to tow the company line. We were very much part of the company line when Trish and I were at LWT. But I think nowadays they have to be very, very careful on the way they change things around. They don't write their own links. They can't have that flexibility to change things on air in, in the junctions, obviously the programmes. We couldn't change the programmes, but we had the ability to change things around to, to make it fit with what we thought was good telly in those days. And uh, looking back and that final day in October, Rob, it was just incredibly sad. And we went on to do stuff with ITV1, you know, ITV1 coming at you, <laughs> as Trish said. <laughs> so we did a little bit of work there. It didn't last that long because what they wanted to do was introduce their new voices. They didn't want to carry on with the old brigade, if you like. They wanted to create a new identity. And that's exactly what's happened now. It's become very much... I don't want to call it crash bang wallop telly, but there seems now not so much pride in the the way presentation is done in ITV. And that was the great strength of ITV back in the days of when Trish and I were on there uh, and my colleagues is that every region had its own identity. It was very different. We ran the same programmes, the network programmes, but it had its own identity, it had its own voices its own announcers who were celebs in those areas i mean nowadays it's the news presenters who are more the celebs in regional television back in the days when i was there it was very much the continuity announcers who would go at open fates and supermarkets and garages and and stuff like that you know and uh, it's it's very changed it's a very different world now so after you leave itv1 as a continuity announcer you become a news reader for meridian Yes. How did that all come about? Before that, I was with Sky News. So the beauty of London Weekend Television, just step back a little bit, if you like. The beauty of LWT was that it freed the week up to do other stuff because it was London's weekend television. Back in the days of the IBA and the regulators, they deemed one ITV company in London to have the seven-day-a-week contract too much. They would basically earn too much money through advertising. So they decided to, to hive it off and have two companies. So you had in the early days, obviously, Thames Television doing from 6am on a Monday morning through to 5.15 on a Friday. Then from 5.15 on a Friday through till 6am on a Monday, you would have London Weekend Television. So you effectively have two companies sharing the revenue from advertising, which was huge in those days. It was a license to print money, what they used to charge. But one thing I always did remember fondly, Rob, and that was the switch at uh, 5.15, the, what they call the BT Tower switch, and you would see it on air. It would like it'd be a fuzzy flick on the screen. Uh, so you'd have the announcer at Thames Television in Houston saying, and that's it, from Thames, we're back with you Monday morning at six o'clock. Now it's over to our good friends at LWT, London Weekend Television, on the South Bank. And there would be this sort of click on air, you'd see it, 
And then yeah. LWT would come on with an ident or an ounce of straight to camera in vision. And uh, that was the 5, 515 switch. And I always remember that. I was growing up with Peter Lewis on HTV. And to actually be working in the end with Peter Lewis on London Weekend Television, it was like a, a demigod. I thought, I'm working with Peter Lewis. I can't believe this. This is great. So, um, yeah, fond days at London Weekend Television. My days in news started with Sky News. And so what happened was I put myself about and did QVC, the shopping channel, for three years. Great fun, selling everything from breast enhancers to power washers to DIY equipment on a Sunday. And I then applied to do some stuff with Sky News. It was mostly weekends and overnights. And then I was there for five years. Back in those days, it was so tough to get into the weekday lineup because they had their own people, their big juggernaut names that they used to use and some of them are still there and there was very little chance to get onto daytime in those days when i was there nick pollard great guy took me on at uh, sky news nick's a very very big person in television news uh, he's more of a consultant these days and then my move to meridian came a little bit later five years later it was almost a welcome break because my two sons at the time were very small didn't see them really growing up that much because i was away at uh, weekends and, and overnights and it was just a, a welcome relief to be offered some work with Meridian Television. So I did a lot of what they call backfill on the main programme and uh, reporter presenting as well, going out in the fields as a reporter presenter. So that was my break into TV news, if you like. I did that for about 14 years with Meridian. Great fun. We were taught in the end to self-shoot. So we went on courses to use cameras, to edit video pictures using Avid, Avid News Cutter, which is a bit of software. So, yeah, those days were, were great fun. And I was also went into the world of lecturing. I lectured in broadcast journalism for uh, three days a week as well in Surrey. Did that for 10 years. So it was teaching students how to news gather and prepare news bulletins for radio and television. We had a great TV studio at uh, the college, the university I used to work at in Surrey in, in Farnham. So, yeah, a, a wide and varied career. And if you told me when I was at school, because I was extremely shy at school, would hardly say boo to a goose. You might find that hard to believe now, but I seriously was quite shy, very shy. And I'm still quite shy even to this day, believe it or not. And to actually end up doing what I'm doing, if you said to me when I was at school, you're going to work on the radio, you're going to work on the telly, I would have said, absolute cobblers no way <laughs> would that happen but it has and it's just been the most unusual career route to date if you get those chances to get into it and you get an opportunity go for it don't hold back don't sit back and say what if just grab it and go with it run with it is what i say absolutely going back to um shopping tv a couple of tv forum members have asked me to uh remind you about the no wet wonder phone <laughs> And the big green clean machine. Oh, not the No Wet Wonder Foam. Yes, I was known as <laughs> Mr. No Wet Wonder Foam. Oh, dear. Yeah, I mean, a guy called David Addis was our regular guest on QVC with this product called No Wet Wonder Foam. And it did what it said on the bottle. It would lift up stains from your carpet. And so we used to do all these demos. Demos sell, of course, on QVC and all shopping television. If you can do the demos and the before and afters, that's that's the power picture. That's what sells. And so David would bring all this product. He set up all the demos. We would do this little spiel. It became so popular. He sold so much of this stuff. It made him quite a wealthy guy. And then he went off to sell it on other channels as a long-form infomercial. So if anybody doesn't know what an infomercial is, it's a long-form commercial, so 30 minutes or so. So we would be in a studio recording this stuff. It went out on about five or six shopping channels over the course of, I think, seven seven or eight years as a non-stop play virtually. Uh, so it was always playing somewhere at some time. And I used to go on holiday. I remember on a holiday in Portugal, I was at the top of this water slide with my two sons and this voice behind me said, hey, Glenn, got any of that no wet wonder foam? <laughs> <laughs> I turned around and he said, he said, I love that stuff. It's great. He said, I'm out of a bottle already. You got any more? I said, well, not with me. I'm on holiday. But um, <laughs> it was it was just this great stuff. So you, you squirt this stuff on the carpet on a stain and it would bubble and it would... The, the idea is that the bubbles would agitate the stain and it would lift it out. It was a great product. So, yeah, my, my days at QVC was, that I think, working on shopping telly. And anybody who's done the same thing will tell you the same. It's the closest you can get to being on the radio, but on the telly. It is totally unscripted. 
you've got five cameras on you you're in one set one minute then you're off to the kitchen set then during a 30 second promo break you're whisked outside with your earpiece in on a radio earpiece with your radio mic and you're outside in the car park selling a pressure washer and then you're back inside you might be in the kitchen selling kitchen products and it was just brilliant so you'd be on air four four hours a day maybe two hours doing jewellery, come off for an hour, go and have lunch, come back, you're on doing different stuff. It was a great experience doing shopping telly. It's just you, the guest, and the product, and off you go. You go and you do your research on the product, you talk to the buyers, why are we selling this stuff? And uh, yeah, and to this day, QVC is a phenomenal success all around the world, selling huge amounts of product, and big name products as well now. We should just mention um, Anthony Davis as well, who is a very good friend of Glenn's. Yeah, he's a great friend, and it was really Anthony who got me back into radio. I used to work with Anthony at the Disney Channel. For those that of you that, that don't know, I used to do continuity for the Disney Channel. A lovely lady called Erica Longdon, who I used to work with on local radio in Kent and in Victor, she became like their chief announcer at the Disney Channel at Chiswick. So I would go up um, one day a week for about a year or so and uh, pre-record all these continuity links. Nothing was live. And that's where I met Anthony. Anthony would come in. He was one of the voices. And we sort of kept in touch. He was, uh, it was a great, what I call, um, friendly anorak. Anthony, I know you're listening to this, and that is true, isn't it? You're a friendly anorak. We're all anoraks at the end of the day in this game. And Anthony actually said to me a while back, look, got to get you back into the radio. Come in and meet somebody at Global in Leicester Square. I'll step back a bit here, Rob, because I lost so much of my work, and so did my wife. She was doing the afternoon show on BBC Radio Kent. Her contract wasn't renewed for some bizarre reason, uh, despite her being extremely popular. Isn't that always the way? And I was, at the time, not working in television. My work with, obviously, the television continuity work had had dried up because of circumstances. My news work had dried up with Meridian. They decided to get rid of lots of people because of cutbacks. I was working with Meridian when they were a a three-micro-region company. So you had the southeast, you had the south, and you had the Thames Valley area. And I was very much working on the southeast. And ITV's Infinite Wisdom, the, the, the Mighty X came down, they got rid of those sub-regions. Central also had a sub-region, Anglia had a sub-region, and they made the programme pan-regional. So instead of having three separate programmes going out at six o'clock from Meridian, for example, in Whiteley, which is where Meridian moved to from Southampton, they moved to Whiteley between Southampton and Portsmouth, they would just lose those sub-regions and we'd just end up with one pan-regional program. As a result of that, I lost my work along with 60 or so other people, sadly made redundant for through no fault of our own. And I then thought, crikey, what am I going to do? Had very little work coming in. We were just up against it financially. And I think everybody has to go through those tough times to appreciate the good times. So what happened was I met up with an old mate of mine who used to do production work at Invicta, a guy called Justin, Justin Mannington, great guy, and he was running his own landscape gardening company. He said, well, come and do some landscape gardening. So I did, and I ended up driving tractors, cutting grass. Uh, again, I had my radio with me. I had my earphones in with the, the ear mufflers over the top. And do you know what, Rob? I'd never been happier. Just no stress. I was on a tractor doing heavy digging with the guys doing landscape gardening. I was the fittest I'd ever been. I had the best suntan ever. And it was at that point that Anthony Davis made contact with me. And Anthony at the time was doing the late show on LBC, doing 10 till 1. And then he went on to work on Smooth London's drive show. Uh, now he's moved to uh, to the USA with his family. Uh, but Anthony said, come in and meet up with Vicky. Vicky used to uh, be in charge of the newsroom at uh, Global. And she said, yeah, we can offer you some work. And uh, I got my first work back in radio as a journalist presenting what was then LBC London News 1152. It's now become a national uh, news station. It's the recently launched LBC News Channel, so it's called LBC News, a bit like Sky News, the idea being you can tune in any 20 minutes and you'll hear the latest news. So Anthony, yeah, bless his cotton socks. Anthony, I know you're listening. Love you. Uh, He said, (laughs) get back on the radio, Glenn, and it's him that got me back into radio again. So Anthony, I shall never forget that. I owe you one. (laughs) Excellent. Yeah. And hopefully find out more when I speak to Anthony Davis in the new year. Please so. do, yeah. Tell him he owes me a meal as well still. 
And <laughs> talking about that, apparently, according to my uh, source, Mr. Nick Harvey, there is a very long-standing joke. Oh, gosh, the 50p it's, joke. You, yes, it's uh. the 50p joke, and I think everyone's going to want to know about it. Yeah, the 50p <laughs> joke. Okay, this goes back to hospital radio days and devices. Nick, I've got to get you back for this one. The rumour is that I always only had 50p on me. I could never buy a round of drinks because I used to tap my pockets at the bar. Oh, blast, I've only got 50p on me. So they actually presented me, when I left DHBS, this little um, trophy, I think Justin Leonard put it together, he's the guy that answered the phone to me originally, put this 50p in a little, almost like a presentation box. It's like Glenn's last 50p. So yes, it was it was true. I was pretty mean in those days with the money and uh, buying rounds of drinks. It's all changed, of course, now, Rob, you understand. I'm very oh, generous these days. I give to charity. Yeah, I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So what are you doing now? Are you are you still doing work in radio and television? Yes, well, at the moment I'm still working. I still work with Global, big, big organisation now, big giant in radio. I yeah. do the news <laughs> on the main LBC channel, and uh, you can hear me between 12.30 and 7.30 on a, a Saturday afternoon. Do the odd shift for some of the other stations as well. So at Global, they match your voice to match the brands, so they deem me reasonable to work on classic smooth and lbc my voice isn't quite up an atom for capital or heart <laughs> so um yeah you get you get put into a category that they think the audience would find your voice most suitable for and so i do that i work freelance for bbc radio kent doing a bit of news for them and uh, i do a lot of voiceover work from my studio at home here e-learning is very big these days i do quite a lot of uh, voiceover work uh, for e-learning online learning a couple of companies i work for on a regular basis and do quite a lot of video production work as well so um yeah i'm in talks with at the moment with a couple of other television companies about maybe doing some work for them but that's uh, to be uh, confirmed so i shan't talk too much about that but yeah it's all it's all pretty good juggling and spinning plates at the moment so uh touch wood long may it continue rob um do you have any advice for anyone who wants to become a tv presenter or a, a radio dj what sort of advice would you give to anyone who wants to do that sort of work i think forget the whole idea of fame i think you've got to do it because you enjoy it because it's something you've always wanted to do and i think you've got to look at it we're living very much in the in the era now, and I used to say this to the students that I used to uh, lecture to at university. We're living very much now in an era of I want it now or I want it yesterday, not I can't be bothered to work for it. In other words, they can't be bothered to be at the bottom rung of the ladder and work their way up. And I blame, I do blame programmes, I sound like an old fart, but I blame programmes <laughs> like The X Factor and a lot of reality shows that thrust people straight into the limelight. I think if you want to get into radio, uh, the roots, yeah, I mean, hospital radio is always a great place to start. University radio, lots of great universities around the country have their own radio service. That's always a good way to break into it. You break your teeth, you learn the industry that way you get to understand how to talk into a microphone how to edit a bit of audio how to edit pictures you know uh, it's a great place to start listen to the experts listen to people on the radio or on the telly at the moment listen to the announcers on sky listen to the announcers on the bbc on uh, itv listen to the way they do it everybody's got a different style you do find your own unique style the more you do it. Don't try and copy somebody. Don't try and be like somebody. Develop your own personality is what I would suggest. Listen to the way other people do it, but don't model yourself on them. And uh, to put together a demo tape, yeah, I mean, if you want to be a continuity announcer, check out some of the websites, some of the careers' websites on those uh, channels. You know, ITV will have their own careers section. BBC have got their own careers section. Sky have got their own career section. Check them out. They're very often advertising for promotion voices, for continuity voices. They occasionally do trawls a couple of times a year for new voices for continuity. Put together a little link, a couple of links on a, uh, a recorder, you know, uh, MP3, a WAV file. Craft it carefully. Speak nicely. Don't talk like that because, uh, you know, and even though a lot of channels are going down that route now, I still think there's room for Queen's English and it's nicely delivered. I really do. Um, and, and I think, again, that's part of my problem now is I've got a neutral accent. I used to have a bit of a West Country accent, but I've lost that, I think, working around the country. I think if you've got a bit of dialect now, if you're in the regions, you know, northeast is very popular, uh, certain areas of the country, you know, you've got, you've got a bigger chance of getting in now because regional accents are very much in. Neutral accents like mine aren't so in demand anymore. I think eventually it'll go full circle. I think 
the neutral accent will come back again. You know, we're good for certain things. I think I'm good for e-learning and uh, the odd promotional voiceover. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's all changed. Very, very different sort of landscape now. But my advice to anybody wanting to get into the industry is have a passion for it. Know the news, because news plays a fair part of what we do. You've got to know what's going on in the world. And be prepared to work bank holidays, Christmas Day, Boxing Day, and not just 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. It is a a seven-day-a-week, 24-7 job. So bear that in mind before you even venture into it, I think. That's my advice. Absolutely. Fantastic advice. And an absolute pleasure to talk to you today, Glenn. Thank you so much for being well, a guest on the podcast. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Rob. Lovely to talk to you. And, uh, yeah, if you get to talk to Nick Harvey again, I'm sure I'll talk to him in the not-too-distant future. Tell him I've got more than 50p on me this time. And uh, I will do. whiskey and American, which is what he always used to drink, is on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure he, um, you hold him to that one. Thank you very much, Glenn. Cheers. Thanks, Rob. That was a fantastic chat. Big thank you to Glenn Thompson for being a guest on the podcast. You can visit his website at glenthompson.co.uk and he is also on Twitter at Glenn Thompson. Well, that brings us to the end of this, the first series of the TV Booth podcast. A big thank you to everyone who has downloaded and left positive and negative comments about the podcast. I do read every one and I do my best to act on my reviews. A big thank you as well to my guests over the last few months, Erin Gordon, Mark Lipscomb, James Mobbs, Mike Bushell, Greg Scott, Trish Bertram and Glenn Thompson. 2020, we'll see some new guests appearing on the podcast and my first guest of the new year will be the game show host, announcer and TV presenter Anthony Davis. For more information on the podcast, visit tvboothpodcast.co.uk but for now, thank you so much for listening and thank you for supporting the podcast in the way that you do. From me, Rob Francis, it's goodbye. The TV Booth Podcast is hosted by Rob Francis. Copyright 2019.